What a great start to the meeting. I'm going to take away with me when I leave uh, one powerful image, which is from that first poem, with the uh, darkness as profound in front of the windshield as through the rearview mirror. Just drive, drive, drive. A great poem. Uh, thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, also, a fascinating poem when you think about the roadmap for the future and, and how much easier it is to move forward if we think we have a sense where we know where we're going. We don't always, uh, but how nice to have a glimmer of it, uh, to have some optimism that pulls you forward. Uh, and maybe as a way of doing that, let me pick on Imani for a minute. Imani, when you're done with Howard, Let's make a hotel executive out of you, shall we? <laughs> that may or may not be the roadmap you take, but to have an idea in front of us uh, makes things so much easier. So let me start by thanking all of you for holding your meeting here at Wardman Park Marriott. We're thrilled to have you here, not only because we appreciate your business, but because we really value the work that you do. All of our associates are here committed to making this meeting as successful for you as you possibly uh, as it possibly can be. Now I come to the podium this morning with a little bit of nervousness. I'm not an educator. I have very little insight into what you do every day and I've got even less expertise. Nevertheless, I accepted the invitation to speak today because I am impressed by what you wrestle with every day, uh, how difficult it is, how important it is to our society. And I really wanted to come to encourage your work and to thank you for everything that you do for us and for our communities. Now, since we're in Washington, D.C., I'm going to start with one of my favorite political stories. A woman in a hot air balloon realized she was lost. She lowered her altitude and spotted a man in a boat below. She shouted to him, excuse me, can you help me? I promised a friend I would meet him an hour ago, but I don't know where I am. The man in the boat consulted his portable GPS and replied, you're in a hot air balloon, approximately 30 feet above sea level. You are at 31 degrees, 14 minutes north latitude, and 100 degrees, 49 minutes west longitude. The woman in the balloon, ro balloon rolled her eyes and said, you must be a Republican. <laughs> I am, replied the man. How do you know? Well, answered the balloonist, everything you told me is technically correct, but you're totally irrelevant to my life. You've told me where I am, but I'm still lost. <laughs> Frankly, you're not much help to me. The man smiled and responded, you must be a Democrat. I am, she replied, how did you know? Well, said the man, you don't know where you are, where you're going. You made a promise you have no idea how to keep. You're in exactly the same position you were in before we met, but somehow now it's all my fault. So obviously, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you can find something to laugh about in that joke. And yet, I offer the joke not so much because it's funny, but because it seems to capture the political environment and the societal environment we're in today. We live in an environment in which political parties seem uninterested in working across ideologies to get at the issues that face our country. We seem more interested in blaming the other side than in solving problems. And nowhere is this trend more apparent than in the area of education. Virtually all of us agree with obvious statements that success in educating our youth is, all of our youth, is profoundly vital to our future. Virtually all agree that education, like all other aspects of our society, must continue to innovate and experiment constantly seeking to fix what doesn't work and improve what does. We know that our educators broadly are deeply committed to providing the best education that they can. You in this room are proof of that. Your commitment to our youth is obvious. But somehow we let our politicians twist our conversations so that conversations about education are often partisan. 
They don't seem to be structured to maximize the chance of finding a path that will work for the future, but instead to maximize the likelihood of disagreement. Added to this challenge of politics, we've got another challenge. It's the challenge that results from having nearly six million young Americans between the ages of 16 and 24 out of school and unemployed. These unemployed need jobs, not only for themselves and their families, but again, go back to the roadmap and the vision, but so that those who are still in school can see in concrete terms why it's important to imply themselves in school and drive forward. Now, we're here this morning supporting the National Academy Foundation because we think it is an ideal organization to address both of these challenges. Our divisive, divisive political debate about education and our need to get young people to work. Through collaborative and substantive leadership, NAF has found a way to build a shared approach to innovation, an approach that brings everyone along. It has found a way to get around the politics and the political wars to take action. Not only has it found a way to move forward, but that movement is producing results. 500 academies in 41 states in the District of Columbia. Welcome, District of Columbia. Glad to have you in the NAF Nation. Ninety percent high school graduation rates. Eighty percent of graduates heading off to college. Results like this for a population that you describe as 65% at risk are very impressive. We at Marriott are attracted to NAF because of these results. Marriott International has been partnered with NAF for many years, 30, I think. The Marriott Foundation has just approved a $500,000 grant to support the work of NAF. And our Courtyard brand, a brand that includes almost 1,000 hotels, has decided to focus its community efforts through NAF. At the Clinton Global Initiative just a few weeks ago, we committed to volunteer 30,000 hours of mentoring, professional development, and job shadowing to 10,000 NAF students and NAF teachers across the country. The stories of young adults like Christopher Kometsky inspire and innovate us. He was a kid from Brooklyn. He hated high school. His father had never finished high school, and he seemed to be heading down the same path. Fortunately, his mother learned about NAF's hospitality program and pushed him in. After an internship at the Marriott Marquis in New York, Christopher said, instead of being a place I dreaded, school became the direct line between me and the job I wanted. I was ready to focus. This spring, Christopher graduated from college. He's on his way. Now, Christopher may or he may not end up working in a Marriott hotel. We hope he does. But our motivation in working with NAF is not fundamentally about that. Marriott's story and its DNA is about maximizing opportunities for all people. 87 years ago, just about a mile from you, a mile from here, J.W. Marriott and his wife, Alice Marriott, opened a nine-stool root beer stand serving A&W root beer. When the weather turned cold, they knew their new business would not succeed without some hot food. So Alice Marriott went to the Mexican embassy and asked for a recipe. She got a recipe for hot tamales. They added hot tamales to the menu, and it became the hot shops. From there, the company grew, first through the Great Depression, then through World War II. It first entered the hotel business in the late 50s, and obviously more and more has focused on that business as its core. Throughout the history, the company motto has been, take care of your associates, and the associates will take care of the guests, and the guests will come back again and again. The motto has led to a company culture which is now shared across the globe in more than 80 countries, of taking pride in the accomplishments of our people, particularly where those accomplishments were least predictable. There are three very current and extreme examples of this. We are opening a Marriott Hotel in Port-au-Prince in the first few days of 2015. The impetus for that hotel was the initiative of our Haitian associates in the United States. 
After the devastation of the earthquake, they raised their voice in Marriott and said Marriott should go to Haiti. Now when we open in early 2015, we'll have 200 associates roughly in that hotel. Their lives and the lives of their families will be transformed through those jobs, and we love being part of it. Not lo long after opening in Haiti, we expect to open in Kigali, Rwanda. Just 20 years ago, thank you. Just 20 years ago, a million Rwandans were murdered in 90 days. A genocide of absolutely appalling horror. We're already working with the Aquila Girls School in Kigali to train them to be ready to open our hotel. Their lives are now filled with a sense of opportunity that was unimaginable to them and to everybody in that country so few years ago. Closer to home, also just about a mile from here, we opened our 4,000th hotel recently, the Marriott Marquis next to the DC Convention Center. The opening team includes 160 associates who've never before had a job. The best thing about that story is walking through with the general manager and the other team at that hotel and sensing their enthusiasm, not just for this gorgeous hotel, beautiful hotel that's opened, but for the impact they can have with those 160 associates and the optimism they can have with the careers that get built there. Now all these stories are about building opportunities for people. Like you, we take great pride in watching our people grow, seize opportunities, and build lives that are filled with purpose and with happiness. This is what Marriott has long loved to do. It is what the National Academy Foundation does so well. We love you for it. We appreciate your work. We're glad to partner with you, and we thank you for your great service. I wish you a great conference.